I'm Councilmember Weezer. I've been joined by Councilmember Englinger, Councilmember Price, and Blumenfield. And um, we'll call the Planning and Land Use Management meeting to order. First item of business is the multiple item speaker cards. This is for items in which public speakers wish to speak on two or more items. We take them at top. Uh, Benjamin Hanelin, I understand you want to speak on items 10 and 11. They're related. Do you want to speak when those items come up? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. I'm representing Instead one of, of now? the... No, I'm representing one of the appellants in number oh, 10. Oh, you are. Well. You're representing one of the appellants. Okay. Yes, so we'll note that. So Benjamin Hanelin is representing one of the appellants on items 10 and 11. So when that item comes up... Okay. Thank you. So we'll move to item number 5. We will adopt that item on consent. There are no uh, public speakers and no objections from our committee members. Yes. Sorry. Um, my understanding is that uh, there may also be changes required to the public works code sections. Um, so if you wanted to amend the, the motion so that that department could also make the same changes in their code as well as planning. Okay, we could do that, yes. We could incorporate those, amend that, uh, our motion to include that change, that amendment. And for the record, uh, Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson has joined us. So ordered on item number five. And for the record, he lost his tie. For the record, he's been influenced by Mr. Englander. <laughs> Item number seven, we will continue to September 18th. Item seven, continue to September 18th. You also lost your little pocket thing there, right? Yeah. Oh, it's still there. And item oh, one oh. is a uh, report from Director of Planning, Vince Bertoni. Welcome, Mr. Bertoni. Uh, thank you, Chair Weiser and members of the committee. I have no report this week, but happy to answer any questions if you have them. Great. Thank you. And uh, just a quick question. How are the community plan updates going throughout the city? Are they being staffed appropriately, and are they moving forward on schedule for a uh, six-year yes. cycle? Uh, yes. So our, our cycle is to have all 35 completed by uh, summer of 2024, and we're we're on that um, we're on that schedule and we're on schedule so far um, so we have been staffing them up the first the first of the new plants we've launched was in the Southwest Valley so there's three plants in the Southwest Valley that we've launched we've have our staffing largely in pay, place for the Southeast Valley we're just now uh, launching the West uh, the West side plans um, we are happy to do a report for you in terms of that in terms of the status, in terms of where they all are. I believe right now the number of plans we have in process is 16. 16 plans out of our 35 plans are in some process of, 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 of under, underway. We were, we, so just kind of in order, if you will, we are um, finishing up the Hollywood plan. That should be getting ready for an environmental impact report to be released um, coming up shortly. Next up would be downtown and Boyle Heights, which will be um, which will be coming out. The draft plans hopefully soon, later this year, early next year. Then we move to the Southwest Valley. Those three plans are are, are up and up and running. The West Side plans are up and running, uh, kicking off. We have Southeast Valley next, and also um, down near the um, South Harbor area is the next round of plans. So out of those are 16 plans that are in some way of, of getting prepared. But we're happy to, to do a presentation um, for you. You know, we love showing you maps and schedules and things like that. So we're happy to do that. Yeah, great. Well, my staff will work with you and your staff to see if we could get an update on sure. where we are in the progress. And I think this is great because we have a uh, system that we're following in a time schedule and people know what's coming next. Uh, uh, previous to this, it was just random what community plan was going to be updated and then some would fall off the map for lack of resources and at least now we're committed to doing it there and it's systematic um, and so it's a, a great process something that the planning department should be proud of so thank you well uh, note and file uh, item number one and move to item number two and mr. Bahia, if you could please call that to order sure um, item two councilman this is a communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Ms. Gail Kennard to the Cultural Heritage Commission. Ms. Kennard 
here. Well, welcome, Ms. Kennard, and this is uh, one term you've completed, or? I was appointed for half of a pre another term, and then this is my second full term. Great. Well, thank you, and thank you for your service. And anything you'd like to share with the committee in terms of your experience and reappointment? No, I've enjoyed serving on the commission, and I think I've been able to fulfill an, an important role, and I like serving the city. Okay, great. Any questions or comments from committee members? No. Mr. Price? Uh, the mayor on his uh, selection reappointment. Uh, I know Ms. Kennard is a uh, committed uh, Angelino and uh, serves our city well, so it's good, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councilman. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Kennard, do, do, you, uh, do you follow football? Um, only for business purposes. <laughs> okay. That's well, because I see here you went to both Stanford and Berkeley. I just want to know which, who oh, you Oh, yeah, I don't for. answer that question. <laughs> And they play against each other, you know. They, they Plus, I worked at UCLA, so I'm really oh, conflicted. No. But that's the big game, you know. People in LA think UCLA, USC is the big game. No, the the real big game is Stanford and Berkeley. That's no. where it all started. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Thank you for agreeing. Basically, <laughs> 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 so thank you so much, and Welcome. and thank, uh, you. thank you for your service. We know you've been an active member of that commission. That you take your work very seriously, and it's been noted. Whether we agree or disagree, it's great to have someone on the commission that's involved and really uh, looks at these projects and proposals. And that type of discussion and uh, debate is very healthy for all of us. So thank you for your involvement. And this is uh, fully support your reappointment. So thank you for your work. Great. Thank you for your support. And I, I, I appreciate it. It's a, it takes a lot of people to make the right decisions. So we're, all, we're just a piece of this. So I appreciate your support. Yeah, and it's uh, a lot of people can, uh, there's difference of, differences of opinion on, on historical nominations, uh, but it, when we bring it all out, it's, it's great to have the different layers of review and discussions, and that's very helpful. We bring out different ideas and concepts in each layer, so thank you. You're welcome. So we'll move the item to full council. Uh, any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, uh, three. Councilman, item three is communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Ms. Gail Willis to the South LA APC. Thank you. Ms. Willis, are you here? Well, thank you for your service. And good You're to see welcome. you. You're quite welcome. It's wonderful to see all of you as well. And anything you'd like to share with the committee? Well, I'd just like to say it has been a distinct pleasure serving on the South LA Area Planning Commission for the last five years, and I appreciate the reappointment. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any questions or comments from committee members? No? Mr. Price. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, for thank, sure. <laughs> thank you, and great to see you. And. Uh, Great to have known you since uh, when I was on the board at the school district. So, Absolutely. And all your great work you do as an educator, and it's very important. Um, you know, some people, uh, you know, it's, it's great to see that an educator is also involved in planning decisions because they're, they're still related. Well, land use Absolutely. issues affect the quality of life for our students and just quality of life in general. So thank you for your service on this commission. You're quite welcome. Okay. Thank you. Any objections to moving this forward? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Item number four. Item four, Councilman, this is a communication from the mayor relative to the reappointment of Mr. Eric Nam to the North Valley APC. Mr. Nam, are you here? Welcome, hello. Thank you, hello. This is also a reappointment and anything you'd like to share with the committee? Um, it's been an honor and a pleasure working for the community and working with the city. And I'm honored to be considered for reappointment. And you're quite busy also on the neighborhood council, so, right, are you still on the neighborhood council? Did you, no, I'm no. no longer on the neighborhood council, you, you, I was. No, no longer on the neighborhood no council? No longer, Okay, yes, good. Yeah. Well, but thank yes, you. that was very busy work. Yeah, thank you for your, uh, for your service, and you lived some time in New York? I did, yes. Yeah, how do you compare New York and some of the land use issues there with here, do you? Oh, wow. Um, Is LA I, becoming a New York? That's what some people say. I was single and without kids when I lived there, so it was a blast. Yeah. I went to visit with the kids, and I cannot imagine them. They were kids. <laughs> insane. <laughs> Great, thank you. 
Any questions or comments, Mr. Englander? No, I just want to thank you again. I'm not sure we'll have to talk offline about the fact that you say it's a pleasure and an honor to serve, but because um, <laughs> uh, you deal with some, some very complex and complicated, most of the things that come before you are uh, appeals and uh, for the most part people that are very angry, much of what we do every day. So actually, thanks for stepping up. But um, for what you do, seriously, uh, Eric, I've gotten to know you and, and seen you work in the community for so many years. Um, and it's exemplary to all folks who want to get involved. But you've always been and had a strong ability to put family first and then community and to serve. And whether it was on the neighborhood council or in this capacity. And I would have no doubt if you didn't have, I'd be actually shocked if you didn't have a special guest with you today as you normally do. Um, and and if, if there's somebody you'd like to introduce in the audience at all. Oh, well, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for those words. Um, yes, I do have my special assistant with me here today. <laughs> Grayson, would you come up? So, this is a voluntary position that actually has a special assistant dedicated <laughs> full time, which is just awesome. Hello. Hello. What's your name? My name is Grayson. Well, it's nice to see you. This is my oldest boy, Grayson. You should be very proud of your father. He's awesome. <laughs> and he's a great photographer, too. So uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you, Council you. Member. Well, thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, we'll uh, move this item to full council <coughs> without objection. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Item number nine. Item 9, Councilman, this is um, a, a CEQA appeal, an appeal filed by Jeanine Le Lestina um, and from the Director of Planning's Determination as it relates to a reasonable accommodation to a person with disability to authorize parking at their property in CD3. Oh, okay, I got it. Okay, thank you. So, um, if we could ask staff present on this item briefly, please. Hello, council members. My name is John Foreman with the Los Angeles Department of City Planning. Um, as just stated, this is an appeal of a request for a reasonable accommodation in Reseda. The reasonable accommodation is a request to an individual with a disability under either the Federal Fair Housing Amendment Act of 1988 or the California Fair Employment and Housing Act. On February 2018, a letter was submitted to the department with the application from a medical provider um, which recommended the request to limit the distance traveled by the individual from their car to their home. Um, the request before us was um, to permit parking in the front yard setback, um, which is normally prohibited in the R1 zone and would require a zoning administrator adjustment. The existing home on the lot was recently demolished and a new two-story home was constructed. Uh, to achieve the parking, the applicant is proposing a circular driveway which results in two curb cuts on this block. Um, they're the first curb cuts and driveway on the east side of the block between Hart and Van Owen. Everyone else has access to their property through the rear alley. The appeal claims accommodation can be satisfied from the alley. Um, the appellants are here, and um, they can explain their points further. Thank you. Mr. Bloomfield, you, you wish to take public comment now, or, or do you want to take up the... Yeah, why don't we start with public comment? Then okay, I'll, thank you. So we'll move uh, to the public comment. Um, we you. have two people listed as the appellants of record, Janine Lestina, and Christine Ferrand. Okay, you want to come up now? You, uh, Brent Ferrand <clears throat> signed up to speak, but we, we take up the uh, people of uh, the appellants of record speak first. So if you wish to speak, if you don't, don't want to speak, speak that's fine. We would like for, uh, Brent to do the five minute speech. If that's well, oh, okay, that's fine. We also have the red books, and they have the pictures, and they're very helpful if you'd like to open them. Okay. And see the pictures. Okay, so we'll take up Brent Ferrand for five minutes. And do you still wish to speak afterwards? You have one minute for yourselves. Thank you yes? Very much. Okay. Brent Ferrand. Hi, good afternoon. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous, but uh, 
what I, uh, each of you has a copy of the information that Mr. Perron, I'm sorry to disturb you. If you could move the microphone a little bit more to the center for you to speak. Yes. Is that better, sir? That's better. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, I beg your pardon. Not used to microphones. Um, each of you has a booklet in front of you that outlines some of our concerns. Um, when we, uh, there are basically, there are 48 signatures from nearby neighbors that are opposed to the circular driveway and to the uh, uh, variance or accommodation. And there are several reasons why. Uh, the first being is that uh, the accommodation, the driveway itself, is going to further disturb the neighborhood. The neighborhood was created in 1948, uh, GI Bill. All the houses are have been kept in very uh, consistent condition with that. Uh, pastel colors, uh, single story. Uh, it's uh, very nice. It's a nice. And what we're looking at here is the house itself. While it's a bit, as you can see from page one, that it's a bit uh, different than the other houses. But the circular driveway will get rid of all of the green space that's in the front. Uh, they've already demolished one of the larger trees that was in that lot. And uh, it's just, it's going to look rather, uh, it's going to look out of place and cause more uh, aesthetic damage to the neighborhood. Uh, the second thing that we noted was that, uh, and that's on page two, is that as far as accommodations for a disabled person, uh, firstly, the house was not built with disabled people in mind because the steps in the front are over 24 inches high. Uh, I'm a psychologist, I work with disabled children, and I know that in order to build a ramp that would accommodate uh, steps that high, you'd need to be about 24 feet long, and there's just not enough room. So uh, secondly also, you would need, in addition to the circular driveway, you'd need that ramp in order to fully accommodate a, a disabled person. And as you can see from their proposal, if you have that, that they don't, uh, they didn't include a ramp or rails in that. The third thing that we noted was that there's some safety issues regarding this. Uh, as uh, Mr. Foreman noted, on that side of the block, uh, there are no driveways. And uh, people have been in that neighborhood for over 40 years they're not used to having cars coming out from that side. So there's going to be some difficulties for that. There's difficulties with school children walking along that way. With people in general, it's uh, disrupting the, the flow for the pedestrians on there. Uh, speaking of disruption, uh, the f next article that I noted was about parking. That particular block has a lot of people on it. And when you put that circular driveway in, you've taken away three, maybe even four parking spaces from the front. And it's already tight. Uh, I go there in the evening sometimes, and uh, sometimes you have to park six, seven houses away in order to get in. So it's very difficult for people to do that. Um, the next one that we had that was important, I guess, was talking about uh, flooding. Now, I know we're in the midst of a drought, but as you know, there are some very torrential rains that we get out here. Putting in that circular driveway removes all of the green area, first of all, which causes more runoff for the neighbors. Secondly, with the cuts that are in there, if you have runoff down the street, the water is going to go up that way and possibly damage other properties. So it doesn't appear that it would be very in the best interests of uh, the neighborhood. Uh, also, when we're talking about safety, the size of the circular driveway that they proposed when I read their plans is eight and a half feet. The minimum that you guys have in your municipal code is nine and a half feet for that very same item. And it doesn't really fit. And with the parking the way it is right now, it would be very conceivable that there are going to be minor fender benders and scrapes and things like that along the way. Um, we also had another issue, and uh, 
that had to do with the cost of enforcing this. Uh, there are a lot of um, cars that are not going to be aware of those driving, uh, driving spaces. There's going to be, uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, tra traffic is, am I have to stop? Okay. I guess I'll stop. Your time is up. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I had on there is we did put in some options that would work very well for uh, a disabled person. Again, I'm very familiar with that. In the back, if they were to put a electric fence into their back, which is, and I have a picture of one that's right there in the neighborhood. If they put a fence in there, we'd be able to open that up and get Great. in. Thank you. Also, the distance is much smaller from there. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Janine Lestina and then Christine Ferrand. The solution to the problem is to... If you could identify yourself, I'm sorry. please. I'm Janine Lestina. Okay. The solution to the problem we feel is to enter to the rear drive. Um, I'm a little nervous now. <laughs> Enter, enter through the alley. Um, our, the east side has an alley, and, and the, we know of other disabled individuals within, the city, within that block who have used the alley. They have a remote gate. They can come right into the backyard. They have an ADA gate going straight right up to their, front, their back door. It's closer to their work area in the house. And, and they are very happy using that method of uh, getting to the house rather than having to um, go to the front door and through the house that way and they don't then interfere with other people and the aesthetics and the fact that other people could be coming up on the driveway. Another thing that's very important too is the fact that the sidewalk, no one, all these people are used to having sidewalk um, and being able to walk their dogs pedestrians, children, they all go down the street, they're not used to having a car, might be coming across the sidewalk. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Janine, oh, you were Janine, okay. Christine Ferrand. I just wanna, I just wanna mention one more thing. Um, we have collected um, 48 signatures. We have letters in the envelope of your packets there. Um, and the community is strictly, there is not one person that we talk to that wants this driveway at all. Uh, the community really does not want the driveway. Um, and there is a good solution. Everyone uses the back alley and they have gates um, and I am, it's 22 feet from their garage to their house. Um, and uh, they can park right next to their, to their back door um, and use a ramp to get in um, and there's many people that do that on the neighborhood and you can see one that uh, ramp was built by the city four years ago for a disabled person thank you very much thank you and now for the applicant Vared Alaverdi good afternoon good afternoon Um, I prepared a statement. If you don't mind, I can read my statement to you. Yes, oh, absolutely. Um, you, have, you have five minutes, sir. And yes, this gentleman is the, the architect that um, submitted the plans to the city. So he was very familiar with the area. Um, and what's first, your name, sir? Your name? Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, we're not going to build any ramp over there. It's just for me to not be able to walk a long distance. I, I applied for this. Uh, permit a while back and um, Mr. Foreman granted me the permit uh, after a very incentive um, looking into the all the laws for the ADA accommodation. Um, I'm a disabled person and I reside at 6926 Chimeneas in Reseda with my son and my daughter-in-law. I applied and was granted a reasonable accommodation to person with disability authorizing parking with a required front yard to my house to, to accommodate my disability in conjunction with the construction, use, and maintenance of a circular driveway. 
I applied for the city permit to con uh, construct the driveway and completed the work. On August 4th, 2018, I received a letter stating that my RE ROA was appealed by Janine Lastina and Christine Ferran, claiming to be a resident uh, of 6930 Chiminias Avenue. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're not a resident over there. They live in Palm Springs and Corona, respectively, with their family. The house was owned by their mother that passed away last year. Uh, none of these people that spoke, they don't live in there. They come once a week to uh, water the grasses. Um, the reason this thing started was because um, after we moved in, we noticed that their um, fence is encroaching into our property. So um, we noticed them and we told them to remove their fence so we can build our own fence. And that triggered this whole um, stuff here that we, we are today we're, we're talking about. Um, the reasonable accommodation application was granted based on applicable law and covers the ADA after a lengthy process and consideration by city officials. Um, looking at the appellant case information, I would point that all the bullet points are invalid because most of the property, Chiminias Avenue, in the right side, have in fact driveways with cars parked at them all the time. Um, there is no shortage in the street. You can, I have pictures of the street showing in any day and night you can park and there's ample parking available at any time during the day and any time during the night. Um, my son and my daughter-in-law will also uh, testify that. Um, a parent's objection is really not genuine. It's fueled by retaliation and discrimination against a disabled person. And uh, the reason was, as I said, she, was, she wanted me to remove the, she wanted me to not tell them to remove the fence. Um, so this was basically filed uh, with, with a retaliation and discrimination in mind. Uh, I respectfully uh, request that this committee um, denied the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Do you wish to speak, sir? No. Okay. Thank so we also have Lucine Arutunian, Tigran Kalashin for one minute each. Good afternoon. I thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to come out and to speak. I'm also a little bit nervous, so please disregard that. Um, I'm going to read my statement. Um, my name is Lucina Arutunian. I'm a homeowner at 6926 Chiminius Avenue in Reseda. Um, I'm here to make a statement in favor of allowing the city of Los Angeles to grant a reasonable accommodation to my father-in-law um, who has a disability and needs special accommodations to park his vehicle uh, in the driveway closest to our front door. My husband, Tigran Kalistian, and I purchased this home a few months ago with the hopes and dreams of starting a family and really enjoying our home peacefully with the neighbors. Um, as a newlywed couple, um, our ability to enjoy our home is at most importance to us, especially with our family. Um, I've never really experienced not being wanted in a neighborhood as much as I am currently. The house to the right of us, 6930. Pendants. Um, so the house to the right of a 6930 North Chimeneas is on, um, I'll skip that part. I'm um, in the few months of living here. We have not experienced lack of parking. Um, furthermore, the reason we're here today is because Christine Fernand and Janine Lestine are prejudiced against foreigners. They've made a statement to me about Mexico and this is not Mexicans and that's primarily the reason she does not want this driveway. She's gone around spreading lies to the neighbors about us and that's caused a lot of distress. And it's lies that we're starting a disability clinic, which we are not. We just want to enjoy our home with our family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tigran Kalstian. Good afternoon, gentlemen, ladies. Uh, my name is Tigran Kalstian, homeowner at 6926 six, North Ave. I'm in favor for this driveway as a recommended accommodation for my dear father who I love and care for very much. 
His well-being and quality of life is the utmost importance for, for my family and I. I know how much this would help my father's quality of life, and we have been placed in the most unfortunate situation of not only having to publicize my father's medical concerns, but also be placed in the defensive to improve my father's quality of life by Christine Ferrand, a resident of Palm Springs, and her sister Janine Lestina, resident of Corona. Christine and Janine have grown a vendetta against me and my family simply because we asked them to remove the fence of their, in their inherited property of 6930 North Chimeneas Ave as it is encroaching into our property as per the Los Angeles City Surveyors. Since then, Christine and Janine have deceived the good people of our neighborhood through lies and manipulation. And when Christine spoke to my wife regarding this matter, my wife was very clear that we are not opening up a business and are, however, trying to build a family and support our loved ones uh, in which Christine responded, I will not let you have this driveway because this isn't Mexico. My wife and I are very offended by this uh, remark and realize that the driveway had less to do with the concerns listed before you today and more with the fact that she has engaged in a hate campaign against me and my family. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes our public comment. Uh, we will now turn to Councilmember Blumenfield, a representative of the area. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I, I know this property well. I'm, I represent this area, and I'm sympathetic with the applicant and certainly any, any sort of disability. And, and the discussion that you cited certainly is intolerable. If there's any um, discrimination issues and those kinds of things, that's not something that we tolerate. However, um, read through the approval of the appeal, and um, there are other options for this kind of accommodation. Uh, that wouldn't so drastically change the character of the neighborhood. You know, we have, it's not just the folks who come forward. We've got 48 folks have written in from that community. It's been a, a, an outpouring of folks who have concerns about uh, changing the character of this community. There is, there are no other driveways on that side of the road all the way up and down. So this would be a, a precedent. Um, and there are other accommodations, the back, the backyard, the way everybody else can get into their unit is, is an available accommodation that could be made and there could be things done with that backyard that could bring you right up to the house. Um, the lots in this neighborhood are typical throughout the city. They're narrow. Um, I don't see how a circular driveway can be accommodated here without basically putting concrete on most of the front yard. Um, I'm also concerned about the condition uh, that this be removed upon sale or vacation. Uh, by the disabled individual. I don't see adequate enforcement to ensure that this occurs. Um, basically, part of the restriction on this would be would have to be removed after the person moves out. It would create a precedent in this area that is a problem. There are options in the real yard, since this is a newly constructed home, to help ease access to the home, including paving from the garage to the home, lengthening the existing driveway, or creating a new driveway to accommodate this individual. So I'm asking my colleagues to join me in sustaining this appeal, denying uh, this particular accommodation. Uh, I encourage the applicant to work with the city and their neighbors on other more contextual solutions. There are solutions that can be put forward, and, and with that, I would move that uh, the appeals of the reasonable accommodation request for 6926 North uh, Tremiris Avenue uh, be granted and that the request be denied. Okay, there's been a motion, been seconded. Okay, um, any other questions or comments? I see none, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Bloomfield's motion to sustain the appeal and uh, um, to sustain the appeal. What was the correct the actual motion? Right. I think it'll be a granting of the appeal. No, we're, gra we're granting the appeal. Granting the appeal. Remove the appeal. The appeal, the reasonable accommodation be granted so that the request for the accommodation be denied. The circular driveway not, not be allowed um, is the motion. Yeah. Council members, uh, Adrian Corsani, City Attorney's Office, just to clarify so that the record can be clear on the findings being made to support the denial. Um, Based on your comments, uh, my understanding is that uh, the issue is with the fourth finding that the requested accommodation uh, would not would require a fundamental alteration in the nature of the city's land use and zoning regulations, and for that reason, um, that, that's the major reason. Thank you. Okay. 
any further questions or comments? So we'll move the motion. It's been seconded, so ordered. Thank you. Next item is item number six and, s no, no, I'm sorry, six. We could take that up, please. Yes, our item six, Councilman, this is a report from the planning department relative to options to either amend, supplement, or create overlays to revise the Ventura Cahunga Boulevard corridor specific plan. Okay, staff here. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is David Olivo, senior city planner with the Department of City Planning. Uh, the subject specific plan was originally adopted in February 1991. It helps guide development in the commercial heart of the San Fernando Valley along 17 miles of Ventura Boulevard. The plan is intended to assure balanced commercial land uses, attractive multifamily residences, and maintain an equilibrium between transportation infrastructure and land use development. As the years have passed, the document has become unresponsive to the changing needs and business dynamics of the San Fernando Valley. As a result, some of the procedures and regulations have proven over time to be problematic to implement and at times work against the goals contained in the plan. In August 2016, the specific plan review board voted to recommend that city council amend the specific plan. In November 2017, a motion by, city, by council offices 2, 3, 4, and 5 to identify options to revise the, the specific plan was adopted by city council. The Department of City Planning was instructed to prepare a report with the assistance of the Department of Transportation and Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. The report before you outlines three options for consideration from the simplest to the most complex and costliest. Option one consists of procedural enhancements. Several processes and procedures that are difficult or time consuming to implement have the effect of delaying or thwarting investment within the corridor. One such example is a requirement that all new tenant spaces and business identification signs file a project plan permit compliance application, a process that takes several months and requires a costly fee. The department has created an administrative review process that can replace the project permit compliance process for some simple projects such as new tenant signs or minor changes of use. The procedural enhancements in this option can be accomplished using existing staff and budget resources and would take approximately nine months. In addition to what can be accomplished in option one, option two would clean up zoning inconsistencies and parcels with dual zoning classifications. This option would include implementing the city's new zoning code in order to give the underlying zoning more certainty and flexibility within the specific plan area. Converting the existing specific plan regulations into the new zoning system will ensure that the plan is consistent with rezoning undertaken as part of the community plan update program in surrounding communities. Option, do, option two could be accomplished in one or two years, would require two full-time staff positions and consultant costs of approximately $100,000 to $200,000 to include environmental review and community outreach. Both the required staffing and consultant costs are included in the adopted fiscal year 2018-19 budget. The final option, option three, includes a review and potential revision to all provisions of the specific plan, including procedures, development regulations, permitted densities, heights, zoning classifications, and assessed fees. The specific plan area would be rezoned and procedures could be streamlined. In addition, context appropriate overlays could be designed to create tailored regulations for varied communities. The, the revision in this option would take four to five years involved two full-time staff and estimated consultant costs that would exceed $750,000 for an environmental impact report and significant outreach. These costs are beyond what is currently budgeted. This concludes my presentation and staff from the Planning Department and the Department of Transportation is available to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I have Meg Greenfield and Osman. You guys are from those public speakers or are they from the department? Okay. Oh, well. Hello. Hello, I'm Meg Greenfield, planning deputy from CD4, okay. uh, and I have a statement from our office. Um, so we're here today to talk about Ventura Cuenca Boulevard corridor specific plan. Uh, our council member is hopeful that the proposed updates to the specific plan are an opportunity to fine tune a near, nearly 30 year old plan. It's a chance to offer additional planning solutions that better serve the business community and residents who shop along 
Ventura and Coingo Boulevards. The council member believes that either option one or option two would be the most timely and cost effective choices and option two in particular comes with the benefit of using the new recode zoning to resolve long standing zoning discrepancies. Um, however, he also understands that no matter which option is proposed, um, LA is currently undertaking a significant level of community planning across the whole city. Um, and uh, including Orange Line, Sherman Oaks, Studio City, Toluca, Coinga Pass, community plan. Um, so these are all going on at the same time. Um, so the councilman would like to ask that community outreach for the specific plan uh, would be thoughtfully considered um, in advance of starting the planning process to ensure that the nature of the outreach uh, the communities consulted and the timing of plan milestones are not in conflict with other planning efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Osman. I am the executive director of Hello. Tarzana Bring Improvement Association. Bring the microphone down, please. Yeah. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, I'm the executive director of the Tarzana Improvement Association. And I deal with business and property owners along Ventura Boulevard, which is part of a business improvement district. Currently, I work with 200 businesses in our area, plus the ones that would like to move in our area. And the biggest problem we all face is the permitting process, and in particular, project permit compliance. That process can sometimes take so long that a potential tenant can just decide not to move into our area. They lose interest. We hope that you will support option one and option two. Thank you. Thank you. Abid Kleinman. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Aviv Kleinman, planning deputy for council member Koretz's office. <clears throat> Following comments from the community, the Encino Neighborhood Council and the Planning Review Board, council member Koretz supports option two of the specific plan amendment options. This option will allow for the cleanup of split zones, create a sense of place, remove outdated zones, and allow for a more expeditious sign clearance process, among other benefits. We request the planning department conducts thorough community outreach throughout the process of the plan amendment. We request that the planning department meets with each neighborhood council along the corridor and conducts an additional community meeting for each community at large as defined by neighborhood council boundaries. We look forward to working with the department and the community throughout the specific plan amendment process. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield? Great. Thank you so much. Um, David, also thank you for the report. Um, I'm really pleased to see the thoughtful response to what we put forward to modernize the, the Ventura uh, Coanga specific plan. It's critically important to have up to date planning documents that are utilizing the best planning practices for the Valley's main streets. Uh, you know, it's been almost 20 years since the plan was reviewed and amended, and almost 30 since it was adopted. Since it deals with so much of the commercially available land in the valley, um, this process is, is long overdue. It's also timely that we're currently, as you mentioned, updating the community plans in the Southwest Valley, and the updates to the community plans in the Southeast Valley are commencing in just a few weeks. So I know I speak for my colleagues who also are uh, touched by this area when I say the process must be done carefully uh, and with full transparency. And with that, I just wanna, I mean, I'm gonna move in a moment to to move us forward with, with the Goldilocks option two, not too hard, not too soft, but uh, I wanted to ask a, a couple of questions, you know, so if we could bring you up for a moment. If the options, as I just mentioned, they're kind of continuum, with one being a very light touch and, and the third being a heavy touch. Um, what if we select one option, but an item in a more intense category also needs to be addressed? What, how do we handle that? Um, if we select one option, we would, we would go with that option and start the environmental re review process for that option. But if in doing so we find we want to include something in the future, we would go ahead and uh, try to incorporate that option into, into the environmental review process. Okay. And, and how are we going to update the process to coordinate with the community plan updating process that are, that are going on right now? Um, we're, we're in constant, um, our, our staff is in constant communication. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's uh, rezoning and recoding going on throughout the entire corridor. We're working with the neighborhood councils. So um, as that process moves along, um, 
we're supposed to finish with the Southwest Valley Community Plan update in 2020 and Southeast Valley in 2021. So this would, this would actually fit timely in terms of any outreach or just um, coordination with those other plans. Because yeah, on the outreach front, we really want to make sure that we get a lot of outreach for each of the communities that's, that's impacted. And toward that question, how is the staff going to be assigned to this project and, and where will the project team be housed? Um, may, maybe Blake Lamb, the principal, can answer that question. Okay, Blake. Thanks. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, Blake Lamb with the Planning Department. So um, as part of the fiscal year budget 2018-2019, a specific plan maintenance unit has been um, included with the department. So that would include a city planner and a city planner associate or assistant. Um, and that unit would be responsible for maintaining all of the specific plans across the city citywide. Um, however, um, there's a recognition that we need to start with some of our most outdated specific plans first with the Ventura Cuenga specific plan having been identified as that as one of those which is extremely old and outdated. And so the unit would start with that specific plan um, and under either option one or option two, um, the unit would be able to accomplish the work with existing staffing as allocated in the budget. However, option three would require additional staff resources beyond which is currently budgeted. And then once the Ventura Cuenga specific plan was completed, um, the department would work with the council offices um, to identify prioritization for the remainder of the specific plans within the city. I'm worried about how they're going to be able to juggle all these projects and still keep focused and and to ask what, what would the impact to the other important specific plan items such as affordable housing amendments in Warner Center or the needs of other areas, uh, cornfields, Arroyo, Arroyo Seco, how is it all? Right, correct. Um, so that's why um, the, the department has identified that either the first or second option could be accomplished with existing staffing resources. Um, in addition, piggy bank, piggy uh, backing on a lot of the outreach work that's being undertaken by both Southwest and Southeast Valley community plan updates. So there's a lot of um, synchronization that can happen with those efforts. Um, but again, option three is really above and beyond our existing staffing resources and we would need additional staff for that work. Okay. And in terms of the, the outreach, we were talking about that. Um, how is it going to be handled? Are we going to have separate outreach meetings for each of the neighborhoods? Yeah, so I think that that's um, one of the reasons why, uh, well, so we have the, as David mentioned, we have the two different community plan updates in process. So we have three in the Southwest Valley that started in 2017. Um, the community outreach for that is currently ongoing and we will be starting our workshops um, for those plans um, in approximately October, November. The Southeast Valley, which also consists of three community plan updates, is going to start our kickoff um, workshops in the fall. Um, and at the same time, we would be um, beginning work on the Ventura specific plan amendment. So one of the things, I think there's been a question um, as we've gone out and spoken with community members and council offices is could the work um, for Ventura be done as part of the community plan update process itself? And our recommendation is that the amendment to the Ventura Cuenga specific plan be a separate effort um, in order to, for us to maintain the six-year schedule um, that our director mentioned during his director's report that we need to, to really keep on track in terms of those community plan updates. However, um, there will be an opportunity since we're already going out to do outreach for those community plan updates. There certainly is an opportunity for us to, again, piggyback on those efforts to be informing um, community members of the work that's being done as part of the Ventura Amendment. Great. I think that's great because I do think they're very different in what their scopes are and, and we've been very clear that the scope is fairly narrow on this one and the scope is broader on the updates and we want people to be real clear about what's going on with Ventura Boulevard and not worried that it's falling into the bigger effort. That's exactly correct. It's very important for us, um, not only in terms of an outreach, just to be clear and um, let the public know what we're doing, but also in terms of our environmental analysis um, per CEQA. Um, we need to really um, maintain these as separate efforts from an environmental perspective as well. Great. And since I'm pushing us toward number two, um, will the use restrictions, either creating them, be on the table with option two? Uh, yes, that, that can be looked at as part of op option two, and we can identify which one specifically during the outreach process. 
Okay, and then does option two allow for a review of the transportation element, including mitigations and fees? And does that require new traffic analysis? Uh, yes, it, it does allow a, a review of um, the, the f fees, right? That one. Um, um, option two would enable us to look at how the fees are spent. So currently the specific plan is fa fairly restrictive in where it enables the money collected as part of the transportation fee to be spent. So it identifies actual specific intersections. And as part of option two, we could broaden the use of those fees. Um, and there would likely need to be additional technical analysis and possibly transportation analysis. But as far as changing the fee structure or um, really getting into um, increasing or decreasing the fees, that would really be um, a separate undertaking that would need additional um, environmental analysis. Okay, and the, the PIA fees collected under the plan, um, are we able to use them to pay for or supplement the dollar set aside for this effort? Do you know? <laughs> That's for me, I guess. Um, so we're going to have to take a closer look at the um, language that uh, is in the plan itself, as well as some of the original documents that um, explain the analysis to, to assess those fees in the first place. Um, glancing at it, I think there was some language that gave us some latitude in being able to use some of that money uh, to fund uh, the analysis. But um, I need to look at it a little closer to confirm. And can height be addressed in under plan under option two? So the um, and Blake Lamb again with planning. The specific plan has, has a height limit of 30 feet, which um, it includes rooftop structures. So the height limit includes things like stairwells or elevator shafts, which normally project above the roof, um, the main roof um, parapet. Um, so there, there could be a way that we could look at changing the definition of height so as to enable projects to construct um, things like stairwells and elevators on their roof. However, um, we would need to consider whether or not any height changes also have the effect of increasing development intensity or density or floor area ratios because that could trigger additional environmental analysis that would need to occur. And, and speaking of that, Density. If changes in density or height are desired by one area, but not another, uh, can that be addressed uniquely to that area? Um, so what option two basically um, would do is it would take existing development regulations and essentially translate them into the new recode zones and then also do some procedural enhancements, um, some streamlining, address the transportation fees. But as far as creating community um, context specific overlays that might increase um, development capacity, that would really need to be something analyzed as part of option three um, because it would require additional CEQA analysis, which we've identified would be an environmental impact report. Well, that's, that's important. I wanted to kind of get that on the record. I mean, if something like that would be dealt with more in the community plan, not in, in this plan. So the community plans at this point, um, as I said, would not be addressing the Ventura um, specific plan corridor because that amendment um, would, is really um, being undertaken as a separate, would be undertaken as a separate process. It would have a separate environmental analysis, whereas the Southwest and Southeast updates both each have their own EIRs. Um, so the community plan update process at this point would not be addressing um, the increase of development intensity along Ventura Boulevard. Great, thank you for uh, answering the questions. Appreciate that. Mr. Chair, I'd like to, to make a motion to move this item forward, if that's okay? Yes. Okay, I'd like to move to, in, I move to instruct the CAO with the assistance of the planning department to prepare a report that provides all fiscal and budgetary impacts to implement option two, including funding the two full-time positions in the planning department to conduct the one to two year amendments to the Ventura Coenga Boulevard specific plan and the estimated $100,000 to $200,000 for consulting costs estimated by the planning department. I further move that the Department of City Planning in coordination with the Department of Transportation be directed to commence preliminary analysis of revising the Ventura Coenga uh, corridor specific plan under option two and that they report back to this committee at the same time as the CAO with an outreach plan that includes meetings at each neighborhood council 
with the, within the plan area, community-wide meetings in each neighborhood council area within the plan, and how technology will be leveraged to ensure a robust and thorough outreach effort in each neighborhood. I request that both reports return to this committee within 30 days. Okay. We'll second that motion. Uh, any other questions or comments? CD4, are you still here, speaker on CD4? Did you, you made some recommendations as well? Were those, did you make recommendations on your comment period? No, right? Okay. I thought you had made a recommendation on this. Okay. Just want to hear that, make sure we're okay on that. Okay, we're, um, we'll move this item without objection. Send it to, that stays here or goes to council? Instructions could either be sent uh, via a letter by the clerk to the departments, or if you prefer, you send it to the council. No, we'll, we'll have it here, and we're going to get this back as soon as those items are re re completed. So we'll keep it here and come back to committee. And you'll, you'll have the letters sent to, by the clerk to the departments okay. with yes. the instructions? Yes. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So uh, item approved. Um, as eight, Councilman, have you continued that item? We're going next to eight. Yes, eight is the next item. Uh, there, there's a request for continuance, Councilman. Are we going to? Oh, I, that's not what I have on my uh, CD4. There's a request to continue item number eight, and do we need the uh, approval of the um, applicant on this item? Or who, who's requesting it to be continued? It's Number denoted eight. on the agenda, Councilman. Okay, I don't have that on my agenda. Is the applicant here? An eight? Have you put in a request to continue this item? Uh, yes, we put in a request with the uh, city clerk's office for an extension of time and a request to continue it to September 18th. Okay. Let me check with my staff. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. We'll continue item eight to September 18th. That's great. Thank you. And the clerk, are you, uh, is the verbal okay, or do you have that on, in record? Uh, on, do you have the documents? Mr. Chair, we have everything on record. We do? Um, okay. Written record. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, we missed that in my notes here. Okay, item 10. Item 10 and 11, Councilman, are interrelated. Item 10 contains three appeals relative to the adequacy of the environmental clearance uh, for the sale. It's a conditional use for the sale and dispensing of alcohol beverages for on-site consumption and public dancing uh, located in CD5. And item 11, Councilman, is an application for public convenience or necessity also on-site at the same property. Okay, so we have, uh, are we have, do we have the same public speakers for item 10 and 11? Do we have the same public speakers for items 10 and 11? No. Uh, I got it. I got it. Okay. So we'll take both these items together. Um, one is the sequel pier for the property located at 520 North La Brea, item 10, and item 11 is the um, PCN uh, application. So, staff? Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Oliver Nepburn with the Department of City Planning. Uh -huh. uh, so the case that you have before you today is an appeal uh, of a CEQA clearance for a related conditional use approval for a project located at 520 and 522 North La Brea Avenue. The ZA approval uh, for the conditional uses were previously appealed and um, those, uh, those appeals were then denied by the Central Area Planning Commission. So as it relates to the zoning administrator action of the conditional use, those um, actions are final. So the case that you have before you now is the CEQA portion of it, the CEQA appeal. In this instance, the, applicant, the appellants have raised um, several issues, um, and specifically with regard to noise and parking. As it relates to parking, the project is located in the transit priority area, and as such, CEQA states that project impacts related to parking within transit priority areas are determined to be less than significant. 
As it relates to noise, the appellants uh, refute the analysis provided in the original environmental document. However, the analysis that was provided uh, relates to compliance with the uh, LAMC noise ordinance. Um, as such, the appellant's challenges to the analysis provided in the original environmental document are not grounded in CEQA, but rather are related to uh, code compliance with the city's noise ordinance. The other points that are raised um, by the appellants are not supported by substantial evidence in the record. However, with that, um, upon the appeal, staff uh, went back and looked over the environmental document. And um, upon reviewing the original document, uh, <clears throat> we found that the, the analysis that resulted in the implementation of a mitigation measure was related to public services, specifically police services. While the analysis in the original MND or in the original environmental document was correct in that it may result in increased demand on police services, that uh, analysis does not necessarily trigger an environmental impact. The impact is related to whether or not uh, the, the increased de uh, demand on police services would require the construction of new police stations that would then result in an environmental impact. As such, uh, the project actually is, results in a less than significant impact as it relates to police services, um, not a potentially significant impact requiring the need for mitigation measures. Uh, upon this, staff recirculated the environmental document um, as a neg negative declaration with a 20-day comment period, um, which is now before you for your consideration. <clears throat> Um, upon the approval or um, upon the issuance of the negative declaration uh, and the fact that there were no impacts that were determined to be significant, um, staff then uh, found the, it appropriate to issue um, for your consideration a categorical exemption uh, under class one category two, which is a non-significant change of use for an existing structure. As such, what is before you is the appeal of the uh, uh, CEQA document related to the conditional use. Staff would recommend that you deny the appeal of the CEQA action and then adopt the negative declaration which was circulated on July, 14, on July 5th for a 20-day comment period, adopt that document, and then uh, find that the project is uh, exempt from CEQA as it falls within Class 1, Category 2 of the CEQA exemptions. With that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you. So we'll uh, turn to the uh, appellant. The appellant is, uh, there's three appellants. Are they separate app uh, appeals or just one appeal? No, there's three separate appeals. Okay. An item, can you show item 10 on my, not coming up. Okay, I don't have any of the appellants listed here. Are you here? Any of the appellants list? Oh, you're representing the appellants? One of the appellants, Tarata Met, Benjamin Hanlon for Lake okay. and Watkins. Benjamin Hanlon? Yes. You have five minutes, sir. Okay, go right ahead. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair and Council Members. Benjamin Hanlon of Latham and Watkins on behalf of Appellant Tarata Met, an Orthodox Jewish school ser serving over 1,000 young children from ages 2 to 14. I think it's fair to say that my comments today reflect the views of other appellants and community members, including schools, learning centers, a nursing home, and hundreds of residents in the immediate area. Due to scheduling conflicts and school opening tomorrow for my client, uh, many of those residents and my client was not able to be here, uh, but uh, they sent me to deliver their message. Our many letters and the appeal detail our concerns, and we won't repeat that here. Suffice to say, the record uh, details them. There's a narrow issue before this committee and then ultimately before the City Council. Is the sequel review for this new nightclub and bar in a highly sensitive area of the city adequate? We say it is not. We ask that the this committee and the City Council grant the appeal and set aside the MND. CEQA requires a lead agency to prepare an environmental impact report for a project whenever substantial evidence in the record supports a fair argument that a project may have a significant effect on the environment. This is not a high bar, and we have more than exceeded it here. 
The record contains extensive evidence, including expert reports that show the project would result in potentially significant environmental effects. The threshold clearly has been met. And I was surprised to hear staff mention that um, exceeding the noise ordinance, the city's noise ordinance, is not a significant environmental effect. Uh, that's not my understanding of how the city generally determines what is or is not a significant effect under CEQA. A violation of the city's noise ordinance is generally determined to be a significant effect. The planning department's own findings in the MND, which is the only document properly before this committee, and other expert reports demonstrate that the Lyrics operation would result, would result in significant impacts to the area. It seems that the applicant and the city have even conceded that the MND does not hold water because now a negative deck, declaration, and categorical exemption are proposed. These came out of nowhere. CEQA is not a choose-your-own-adventure children's book. There is a process. The law does not allow the city council to sub substitute a new CEQA document in the face of our appeal when the only issue before this body is the MND. CEQA and the city's charter specifically limit the city's jurisdiction to an up or down vote on the MND. The ZA and APC approved the MND. We think they did so wrongly. Your job is to say whether you agree that the MND complied with CEQA. It did not. Because neither the NEGDEC or the categorical exemption were before the APC, the city council has no jurisdiction to review them. The city council does not have discretionary land use the discretionary land use application before it, so it cannot possibly determine whether either the neg deck or the categorical exemption is appropriate. In all events, the neg deck and the CADEX would fail for the same reason that the MND does. Switching gears to the item covered by number 11, uh, the, public, uh, the application for a determination of public convenience or necessity, um, that also should be, that should be denied. Again, this is not Hollywood Boulevard. This is a community filled with numerous synagogues, numerous schools, a senior home. This is not the place for a nightclub. There is no parking for the nightclub. This means that its customers, who will be coming and going at all hours, and many after a long night of drinking, will traipse through the community to reach their cars, greatly disturbing the residents, the shuls, and the schools surrounding the site. Additionally, the PCN is not appropriate because the current certi certificate of occupancy for the building isn't even for a nightclub. It's for a school. That means they're trying to get a PCN for a building that the Department of Building and Safety would not allow a nightclub to go in today. It's a school. It's my understanding that, they, that the application to change the certificate of occupancy for the building has lapsed. There's no pending request with DBS to change the certificate of occupancy, so the PCN is entirely premature and should not be considered by the City Council at this time, and we respectfully ask that your committee recommend that the City Council deny the application. To close, for the sake of the community, we ask that you grant the appeal and find that the MND does not satisfy the City's CEQA obligations and that you deny the request for public convenience or necessity. A new bar and nightclub in the middle of this community is not convenient or necessary. Thank you. Thank you. The applicant? Is the applicant here? Yeah. Aaron Betit, that's who I have here. Uh, Ryan Braun is the applicant. I'm okay. the representative of Kiyoshi Graves, and we've also signed up Aaron Batit, who's the acoustic engineer, to speak. Okay. He should have a speaker card yeah. in, and our okay. representative or counsel is here as well. We have five minutes, how you ever you wish to use them, and any individual person that hasn't spoken can sign up for one minute. So, okay. I've signed up individually under the PCN portion of PCN? it. PCN, okay. Got gotcha. you. I got Kiyoshi Graves and Frank Revere who signed up. Right. Okay. okay. Okay, and Aaron Batita signed up individually under the CEQA portion of it. Okay. Okay. Go okay. ahead and speak. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Braun, and I am here today to speak to this committee about a project my family and I have supported and developed over the past 12 years. Following a 20 year history of theatrical performance and education at the Lyric site, my family purchased the facility in 2006. After eight years of strictly nonprofit programming, a decision had to be made. 
find a way for the Lyric to maintain its community outreach in the face of economic hardship or permanently close its doors. In 2012, I began the transformation of the Lyric from a charitable space into a competitive arts facility that would provide relevant, multifaceted entertainment while furthering its philanthropic missions. Averaging 120 shows per year, my company, The Lyric Presents, provided evenings of finely crafted entertainment representing culture from every demographic. Each evening was permitted for alcohol sales by the Alcohol Beverage Control and the Los Angeles Police Department in compliance with all permit regulations, resulting in an extensive history of responsible operations without incident. We are grateful for the unwavering support of these departments throughout the years and their continued support through this process to secure our right to be fully operational. In addition to the concert and comedy programming, the Lyric became home to the Los Angeles Drama Club, the country's youngest Shakespeare troupe, and its very own Arts for Autism program under the guidance of the Kennedy Foundation, their program, Speak Truth to Power. The Lyric is also responsible for the only annual off-site fundraising for the Los Angeles High School of the Arts. Over the years, the Lyric has also been fortunate to garner support from high-profile community members, such as Quincy Jones, who started a series at the, Lyric, at the Lyric that showcases young musicians who are preserving jazz culture and history in America. Our vision to build the Lyric into an institution was realized, and the step to secure financial stability became necessary. In preparation for our zoning and license applications, and to vet the application's viability, we retained a sound tech to perform an acoustical study in order to better understand what, if any, sound mitigation was necessary. This study was entirely elective. It was not a request made by the city and was never intended to be dissected in court. This study was simply to provide us information on the property. In 2016, Aaron Batit attended a rock concert, a famous 90s band named Sum 41, and found the building fell below the legal sound ordinance. As a gesture to the neighborhood, we voluntarily elected to pursue the sound abatement further, despite the study's results. Aaron provided an analysis and suggested that a lowered ceiling in the concert room would significantly decrease any sound leaving the building. This $25,000 improvement was installed over a year ago. This acoustic study and the implementation of further mitigation was intended to be a gesture in good faith to our neighbors to demonstrate our commitment to this commercial corridor. It was never required. On a personal level, I question our opposition's motives to disregard this issue. Our position is and will always be to exercise goodwill toward our neighbors. On October 25th, 2016, my team and community presented at City Hall in pursuit of a certificate of use permit for the on-site sale and consumption of alcohol and the certificate of use permit to allow for patron dancing in a commercial district and in line with the city plan. 80 supporters consistent of parents, teachers, artists, employees, and neighbors were present and provided eloquent testimony that celebrated the Lyric's efforts and many accomplishments. Five months later, in April of 2017, the CEP and CUX approvals were delivered. The approval documents all of, our, all of our support, quoting community members' testimony, and recognizing this establishment to be integral to the health of the arts community. The zoning approval represents a long period of examination that determined that the Lyric is a project that, quote, will enhance the built environment in the surrounding neighborhood or will perform a function or provide a service that is essential or beneficial to the community, city, or region. Following the closing of our case without appeals, we went on to complete a comprehensive list of improvements that included the professional sound abatement, ADA upgrades, a security system with cameras on La Brea and the back alley, and a fire suppression system. After a walkthrough with Officer Philip Choi of the LAPD, we received written approval stating, quote, we are impressed with the detailed security plan proposed and we look forward to seeing it completed and practiced. We, LAPD Wilshire Vice Unit, have no additional recommendations and no objections proceeding forward. Seven months later, the city elected to reopen the closed case due to an internal clerical error. Appeals were submitted and in February of 2018, an appeal hearing was held here at City Hall. During the eight hour long hearing, testimony was heard from an additional 50 members of our community as well as our oppositions. In preparation for the hearing, in preparation for the hearing today, I elected to not invite my peers to speak on our behalf. It is my belief that my community has shown again and again its sophistication and professionalism. We have consistently proven throughout the three years of this application, throughout these hearings and appeals, that the Lyric and its community are of vital importance to the diversity of this city and has accomplished years of unblemished performances with alcohol present. I only have a little bit more. <laughs> I have faith that this committee will honor the efforts of my family and I have put forward to put, build an elegant business with, that is responsible, exemplary, and representative of the culture it nurtures. 
I stand here now and ask that you deny the environmental appeal, approve the PCN application, and award this responsibility to me, my team, and the Lyric family at large, so that we may continue our important work and efforts to contribute to the health Great. of the artistic community and the cultural renaissance of this city. Thank you. Thank you. Who wishes to go next? Kiyoshi. Aaron Petit is the acoustic engineer who conducted a study of the site to look at noise impact. Okay, you have one minute, sir. Yeah. He signed up uh, separately as a speaker. Is it still? Oh, it's one minute. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. I, I'll keep it short. Uh, I am Aaron Petit with the Centec. Um, I was contacted by Ryan um, at the Lyric Theater to do a, a noise study for them. And the reason why I was doing the noise study was because they were doing improvements to the space and they wanted to see what they could do to help contain the sound better. During the course of the noise study, um, with the information and the, and the access that we were at, we tried to gain access to um, the balconies that were overlooking this roof, but it wasn't possible to do that. So, but during the course of the noise study, we um, essentially showed that there was, they were, as they were running it, they were in compliance. Even though they were in compliance, Ryan still wanted to uh, help improve the, the sound isolation, so we included some additional stuff. We were limited by the structure of the space because it's a historic s structure. Um, but we did as much as we could at a significant cost. My report was not intended as a CEQA uh, document. It was not intended to be used as part of that evaluation or any sort of uh, negative, mi mitigated negative deck or a negative deck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Frank Revere. I represent the Lyric. Uh, I simply want to say as, as uh, Ryan Braun said, there was extremely considerate and thorough review of this application and its impact in any possible, from any possible noise or environmental issue. It, specifically, however, it has to be understood that the activities of the Lyric Theater do not interfere with the neighborhood to the extent that, for example, the school that's one of the appellants opens at 8 in the morning and is closed at 3 or 4 in the afternoon. The Lyric is not in operation during those hours. Uh, I think that plus the uh, mitigation factors that are in the CUP uh, make it a uh, places in a situation where there are sufficient controls and sufficient uh, monitoring actions that should allow the Lyric to pro provide its services in the community. However, if it fails to comply with any of the mitigating factors, then the you. other appellants would have all of their rights. So, right. thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Kiyoshi? Kiyoshi Graves, representative for the applicant. Thank you, honorable council people, for hearing this matter. And we wish to thank and really applaud the City of Los Angeles Planning Department for doing such a comprehensive job on this matter. The determination is many pages. The conditions now run to 41, which include a mere six-month term for this grant. That's unheard of these days. As you well know, conditional use permits are not, they do not expire. Um, that was done at the suggestion of Councilman Koretz, who supports both denial of the CEQA appeal and the, the granting of the PCN application. Councilman Koretz wished to balance the needs of the community that is there and also encourage and foster new commercial development in the area. And alcohol service is vital for the sustaining of theater uses throughout the city. So not only is there the six months term, there's a mandatory plan approval that is uh, triggered by the planning department. So there are numerous safeguards on this grant. We urge you to deny the CEQA appeal, grant the PCN application, and follow the guidance of Councilman Koretz on this, who's deemed this project worthy of approval. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Aviv Kleinman. Good afternoon, honorable council members. Again, Aviv Kleinman for Council Member Koretz. Uh, council Member Koretz was very concerned about the ZA approval originally of a CUB and CUX at this location. The council member has a long standing history of protecting the Orthodox Jewish community in that area. Council Member Koretz discussed this matter with the zoning administrator and held numerous meetings regarding this issue, including representatives from both parties, and had his staff visit the site. Ultimately, 
while there have been many concerns, the fact that the Lyric has been operating without any complaints to our office or major issues, we understand why the ZA approved this matter. That said, we would like to request and have requested at APC a number of conditions to address any potential land use impacts going forward. Number one, no operation during Jewish high holidays. Number two, in addition to the security plan that was proposed, Councilmember Kress requested one additional security guard. And number three, to address any potential future issues, we requested that a six month plan review through the offices of the ZA be required for this project. We understand that without these conditions, this use could disrupt the Orthodox Jewish community, which is why our office is asking for these conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Have those, uh, those are new conditions that are being proposed or have they been submitted already in part of the proposal? So they were asked for at APC. They were asked for at APC. Um, was that the motion at there or, or let me ask the planning staff. Yeah. Hi, uh, Oliver Nepper and Department of City Planning. Um, yeah, so those... Um, well, they those, were adopted already. They were adopted APC. by APC and so those are part of the, um, the final action of the ZA's action. Yeah, and what, what were those conditions again? Uh, no operation during the Jewish high holidays. Okay. Um, that there, in addition to the security plan that was proposed, um, one additional security guard, and yeah. to address any future potential impacts, requesting a six-month plan, plan review through the Office of Zoning Administration. Okay. And how big is this theater? How many seats does it have? What's the capacity? Do we know? Uh, um, the applicant would know, or, or do you know the? Yeah, the applicant. Do you want to? You wish to speak to that? Um, our standing capacity is 318, and the seated capacity is 125. Okay, and, and what type of performances do you have there? Um, we have comedy shows. Comedy shows are um, a little more simpler. It's just an audience seated, um, a comedian or, or ten comedians, depending on the evening. Um, and a concert programming, it'll be a full audience standing um, with a band on stage. Okay, and, and is there a separate location for dancing, or is that you? No, is that we just, we wanted to permit for the use, so... In front of the stage, there's 125 square foot allowed patron dancing. 125 didn't square want to feet. Get fined every time someone was. Okay, and your you know, operations are till 2 a.m. That's what you mm -hmm. proposed. Yeah, evening uh, performances until two. Yes. Yeah, and that would be for the live performances you have there. Yeah, the, okay. the children operation usually runs through the day, after school programming, that kind of thing. But that's not yeah. really under debate at the moment. Oh. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Um, you know, we, uh, we are inclined to support what the local council member supports. They know the community well. I would just ask that in the six-month review that, I don't know how to do this, but special attention be paid to the planning, that six months is not too far away, pay special attention to the hours of operation till 2 a.m. Um, uh, if it's a theater and we're asking for alcohol, you know, some of the theaters that we're proposing, even in downtown with a lot of other entertainment, we usually go to 12 or, you know, we, we don't set that long of an hour. To us, we allow 2 a.m. if we do see a club. Um, so if the applicant is uh, proposing themselves as a theater with performances, live performances, concerts, music, small dancing floor, um, you know, that is a, a theater performance, but at 2 a.m. doesn't really co coincide with that. So... So we're, uh, if we could just pay, pay special attention to that on the six-month review. Mr. Marquis harris Dawson. I would uh, just agree with everything Mr. Wizard put forward. I've been to a couple shows at this um, theater, so I uh, can appreciate the space and the limitations. Um, one thing that I might uh, ask the applicant, particularly on the weekend nights when you serve alcohol, um, is it possible for you to have a pickup and drop off space for car sharing just to encourage people not to stumble down the block looking for their cars? Because I, I mean, you, I had to park pretty far away. And if I had been, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we were at some point considering making it a loading zone, mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't want to apply for that until further along. So this but absolutely. Okay, great. And, and thank you. And I would just join Mr. Wizar in, in um, noting that, that I, I would really look for this six-month report because uh, it's it's, it can be a challenging location. Great. Thank you. Um, 
Well, we really appreciate some of the concerns raised by, uh, by the uh, appellants. Uh, what's before us, however, is the CEQA review. And on the CEQA matter, um, we, at least based upon the record and some of the comments made by the local council member, uh, doesn't meet the threshold of uh, an appeal. Uh, so we'll I'll move to deny the appeal and grant the application for the uh, CUP. Anything else that we'd like to add to that? Yes, council member. So um, the planning department has also recommended that um, you reject the APC's recommendation um, to adopt the MND and instead adopt the negative dec declaration um, and also determine that the project is eligible for the CEQA exemption um, with no exceptions to the exemptions being triggered. Okay. We'll incorporate that into the motion and, um, uh, and move that forward, uh, deny the appeal and incorporate those items without objection. With respect to item number 11, we will uh, grant the PCN. Anything, any language I need to add to that? No. Just any objections to that motion? See none. We'll uh, uh, grant the PCN with no objection as well. Thank you. That concludes items 10 and 11. I believe we have general public comment remaining. Reverend Dr. Milou Desire, not here. All right. Mark O. Anybody by the name of Mark O? Seeing no more further items on the agenda, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>